Okay, good morning. So let's start. I have a couple of announcements uh, before we start the lectures. First of all, uh, my name is Emad Taj Horshid. I'm one of the group members of the theoretical biophysics group here. And uh, we are very glad to have you all here. And I hope that you are enjoying your time during the summer school. So today, after the morning sessions, we are going to have a photo. And we have a sunny day, apparently. And hopefully, we will have a very nice photo. So please be there. And don't forget this. I try to remind you again of this uh, event. Uh, and then, actually, we decided to have a demo for those of you who are interested to, to experience haptic device and the way we, we do interactive molecular dynamics. So we can have, actually, three sessions each 30 minutes uh, this evening after your hands-on sessions are done. And we can have 15 persons per session. So we are going to have tickets by the coffee break time, and we are going to distribute this. Please think about this and decide which ones you are interested in so that we can distribute these tickets fast. Uh, OK. So as you see, actually, the program, I mean, uh, we are going to have, according to the program, we are going to have three one-hour lectures. One of them is called uh, Introduction and Example. The second one is aquaporins, and the third one is nanotubes. But the, you will see that we are going to have actually one continuous long lecture, and these times are not really uh, followed during these lectures because the introduction part is pretty short. The main lecture would be on aquaporins, and then at the end we will have nanotubes, including a review of tutorial materials and what you are going to do this afternoon very briefly so that we are clear about that. So we might not be following the schedule here uh, time-wise. And then we will see how we, how we do about the coffee break. OK, so uh, again, as I ex uh, briefly mentioned, I will have a very brief introduction to membrane and a few examples of membrane channels for which we have crystal structure available. And we can study using molecular dynamic simulations. Then we move to aquaporin water channels. And the reason that I chose or we are going to talk about this example today is that it's a nice example to see how we model membrane proteins in membrane for those of you who might be interested to model a protein in membrane. So we talk a little bit about the modeling setup and procedure that you might follow to model membrane proteins. Then uh, it's basically uh, an extract of about two years of research in this group. And I guess it includes a lot of nice examples and ideas about how to analyze the data of your molecular dynamic simulation. So you run a trajectory. You heard a lot about how to run trajectories, how to quantitatively analyze, analyze the data that you have. But it's always important to relate the information and what you get from the simulation to the function and biological significance of the system if you are working on a protein, for example. So, and because we have a very complicated system in the case of macromolecules, it's always difficult to find out what is the right place to look at and what feature you should analyze. And I hope that actually by looking at this story of aquaporins and by walking slowly through the, uh, the story with me, you get enough ideas about uh, possible places to look at after doing the simulation. And, uh, then at the end, as I mentioned, we, we talk about nanotubes because these are actually what you are going to use this afternoon for your uh, uh, hands-on sessions. And talk a little bit about the exercise and a little bit of theory of water transport through channels, through nanotubes, for example, and how we can do this and study this uh, using molecular dynamics simulations. OK, so I'm. Um, uh, I decided to start from the very, very basic idea of why we need membranes, because actually this is very important in understanding part of the results that I'm going to discuss with you. Basically, we need membranes because water is the medium of life. Most of chemical, biochemical reactions, actually, all of the chemical reactions, uh, I'm sorry, biochemical reactions take place in water, probably because life is started in ocean few million years ago. And that's why if you want to somehow 
isolate the interior of a living organism or living cell from its environment, you need to have something which is basically not soluble in water. And that's why fat molecules are actually ideal molecules to isolate the interior of the cell, which is mainly water, from the outside, which, which is again mainly water. So that's why we need membranes, okay? And basic idea is why, why, why we want to isolate the cytoplasm or the interior of the cell from the outside is because we want to conserve some valuable materials. See, thank you. Thanks. So like high energy materials that are synthesized by cells, nutrient, etc. And at the same time, we want to protect the interior of the cell from undesired substances. So basically, it is a barrier against permeation of mainly water-soluble substances. And as I said, lipid molecules are ideal for this purpose because they are composed, actually, if you look at the lipid molecule, it's composed of a head group, which is usually charged or very polar, and then we have a hydrophobic or two hydrophobic tails. So this, these molecules, when they, when they find each other in a water environment, basically, because of hydrophobic interaction, because these tail groups want to aggregate and want to avoid water because of what we know as hydrophobic interaction or hydrophobic forces, so they can actually aggregate uh, automatically, spontaneously, and if you put these molecules in water, you just uh, let them stay there, give them some time, they can self-assemble in different forms depending on the size and shape of these head groups. But one of the possible arrangements that we have for these guys would be a bilayer, which is what we have in cell membranes. In a bilayer, as you see, <coughs> we have head groups arranged in this layer, which is exposed to water on both sides, and then we have hydrophobic core of the membrane. And it is very, very interesting because you can have a very extensive arrangement of these lipid bilayers up to millimeters, which is too, too, too much even for a big cell. And then um, they self-assemble again in water. They have a tendency to close on themselves and completely form a complete cell. And uh, they try to avoid holes in themselves. So if for any reason you insert something, you take it out, they try to seal this hole generated in this. And this, this is very, very interesting because at the same time, you have a sealed environment, but very flexible. You can insert proteins in it. You can give it more function and features. But at the same time, you are very efficiently isolating the outside of the cell from the interior. OK, so we know why we need the membrane, but why we need them, the membrane channels at the same time? The answer is, of course, clear, because still cells need to communicate with outside. They still need to be able to transport some of those substances that are uh, basically blocked by a cell membrane. And that's why we need a specific mechanism for those substances to, to be transported from outside to the inside or to in the opposite direction. But of course, it has to be done in a very highly selective manner. And that's my whole point of these two or three slides. Selectivity is a very, very important feature of channels. You don't want to have only a hole through which everything can be transported, because then the whole idea of having a membrane is under question. So selectivity is a very important feature. Of course, it's not 100% in some examples, as we will see later, but this is a the uh, common feature of many membrane channels. Okay, so in summary, membranes are basically a highly selective permeability barrier. They, they provide the cell with a highly selective permeability barrier. Some molecules can pass, some molecules cannot. And at the same time, they have many, many other functions. I mean, through evolution during the million years, uh, we have more, more, more and more functions for these membranes. We have many, many proteins that give a lot of functionality to this, to this membrane. It's not only a selectivity barrier or a permeability barrier, I'm sorry. So you see we have proteins like receptors that can detect a lot of signals from the outside, including light, chemicals, hormones, uh, neurotransmitters, drugs, etc. 
channels, of course, are responsible for exchanging of material across the membrane. But then having a membrane which is impermeable to ions gives the cell the capability of establishing an electrical potential across the membrane, which this, this electrical potential is used a lot for energetics of the cell and also for neurophysiology, for signaling and for uh, function of neurons and muscles, as you know. And of course, they are involved in, in energy transductions, in, uh, uh, in photosynthesis, and also in oxidative phosph phosphorylation in mitochondria. It's important to realize that we have also some internal organelles that have similar membranes, but just uh, this is important just to remember this. So one of the features which is interesting for us with respect to simulation is, is explained in this slide. If you look at the lipid bilayer, um, first of all, if you compare diffusion coefficient of a lipid molecule with water, you see that uh, it is much, much smaller than water as expected. But then if you come to, to a membrane and compare the diffu lateral diffusion of a lipid molecule, just motion of this lipid in the same, bi in the same monolayer with its flip-flap motion or transverse diffusion in which a lipid molecule goes from one, one monolayer to the other monolayer, we have a very, very big difference between these two, almost nine orders of magnitude difference. Here, we have a diffusion coefficient of about one micrometer squared per second, which corresponds to an average displacement of 50 angstrom in about uh, 25 milliseconds, okay? So that means that if you run your simulations for a, for a very, very long time, for a few, millisecond, you might be actually able to see a few of these lipid molecules moving around and this, uh, exchange their position. And that's why you usually don't observe exchange of position of lipid molecules in your nanosecond simulations. But then when we come to this event, it is very, very slow and you have only once every several hours, which is basically zero, considering the rate of production of lipids and its motion and other events in the cell. And this is very important because uh, lipid bilayers basically are asymmetric. They are always asymmetric. So the composition of this monolayer is very different from the, the other monolayer. And you want to prevent the mixture of these lipid molecules. And that's why this flip-flap uh, exchange of lipid molecules are, are very slow and are basically forbidden in, uh, in lipid bilayers. On the other hand, lateral diffusion allows the system to be flexible, to move around, to allow proteins or other molecules to be inserted to the, to the membrane and uh, give additional functionalities to the membrane. And the importance of asymmetry of the membrane is just exemplified here by two uh, proteins. One of them is a receptor. In this case, it's a ros uh, rhodopsin. And you understand that one side of the receptor is probably responsible for detecting a signal outside the cell, and the other side is responsible to interact with, with another protein inside the cell. So it's very important that this, this protein is inserted in the right direction to the membrane. And the only way that protein can understand what is the right direction is the asymmetry of the composition of lipids in, in, inside the lipid bilayer. The same is true when you are dealing with the pump, for example, that pumps sodium outside and brings potassium inside the cell. If this protein is inserted in, a, in an opposite direction inside the cell, basically the function will be reversed and it would be a catastrophe for the cell. Uh, one last point about uh, bilayers and uh, cell membranes. We have a lot of proteins, basically, inserted in, in, in different cell membranes. Depending on the function of the cell, this protein-lipid ratio might be very different. In some cells, like in your neuronal cells, in which we just need to insulate the interior and exterior because we want to establish an electrical potential across the membrane, basically we have pure lipids, a few proteins, very, very low concentration of density of proteins. In other membranes, on average, we have 50% protein, 
some cells, like those membranes which are dealing with energy transduction, can have actually up to 75% of protein because the only function of this membrane is basically produce as much energy as is possible. And uh, here is one example. This is actually one uh, light harvesting complex which is basically responsible for absorbing light and conversion of light energy to an electrochemical gradient across the membrane. And of course, you want to have a very, very high density of, of protein inside the cell because that's the main function of this part of the membrane. And you see how packed these proteins are. Actually, this array can, can, uh, can be expanded much, much larger than what is shown here. And this is another example. This is, again, a protein which converts light energy to proton gradient across the membrane. And you see that we have basically only proteins which are packed in this hexagonal arrangement here. We have three proteins. This is bacterial rhodopsin. And in the middle of the proteins and between the trimers, we have a few lipid molecules just to fill the gaps between the proteins. So you see, again, we have a very high concentration of protein. And uh, if you look at the permeability of a lipid bilayer or a cell membrane, as you expect, basically, those molecules which are a little bit hydrophobic and uh, are not completely polar or charged can still be transported across the membrane, across a pure lipid bilayer without any protein. And molecules or uh, species which are charged basically are impermeable. They cannot pass the membrane, and the reason is clear because these guys are pretty happy inside water. They can be sol solvated by many, many water molecules that stabilizes their charge, and it is energetically very costly to get rid of these water molecules and to bring them in the hydrophobic core of the membrane, which doesn't have any solvation energy for these guys. So these guys need to have channels to be transported across the membrane. In the case of water, we have an exception. This is a polar group, but it still can be transported very fast across the cell membrane. And the reason is that we have a very, very high concentration of water always present. This is one of the reasons. The second reason is that it's, it's a very small molecule, and it's not charged, of course. It's not like ions which are charged. So these properties give it the possibility to, to be able to be transported across the membrane in significant amounts even without any specific mechanism, like a water channel. So as I mentioned, actually, because cell membranes are completely impermeable to ions, you can establish different concentration of different ions across the cell membrane. And depending on this concentration, electrochemical potential of these uh, species and the permeability of membrane, which can be controlled, uh, you can establish actually an electric potential across the membrane which is used by excitable cells like neurons and uh, muscle cells. It's always negative inside and positive outside. Potassium is always a uh, uh, cytoplasmic ion, uh, yes, and sodium is always uh, in higher concentrations outside the cell. And this ratio is usually 10 to 1 the same here. OK, so that's why actually you need to have ion channels if you want to transport ions across the membrane. And there are a few properties which are common in ion channels. First of all, of course, they are membrane-spanning proteins because their function is to transport ions across the membrane. They are hydrophilic ion conductive pathways. They just want to compensate for the hydrophobic core of the membrane, which is the main barrier against ion transport. And that's why you want to provide a hole which is hydrophilic enough to be able to bring an ion from bulk region to the interior of the, of the, of the channel. So for the ion channel, it's imperative that you have a very, very uh, strong electrostatic interaction with the ion inside the, the channel. Because they are very hydrophilic inside, they are usually filled with water. And uh, usually, the ion which is passing through the channel loses its first hydration shell uh, when it wants to pass the, the channel. Because 
They, are not, they cannot be, ion channels cannot be large. If they are too large, they cannot be selective. We will see this later, how important the size of a channel is in, in its selectivity. And if it is small, that means that only ion can get into the channel. And that's why you need to get rid of this first salvation shell of ion, uh, which is usually between four to six water molecules. You have to get rid of them and bring the ion inside the inside the channel, and that's why you have to provide compensating stabilization energies inside the channel. Otherwise, you cannot compete with water, and you cannot bring in ions. And usually, they have gating properties because these are very important. You should be able to open and close these channels, otherwise you don't have any control, and basically you're providing passive mechanisms for transport of ions, and that is uh, not good for your cell. Okay, so, and this is actually experimentally very important. That's why we have very precise information about ion channels, even about a single channel. When it opens, because a charge is transported from one side to the other side, we can measure it very, very precisely. This is actually uh, in contrast to channels like water channels, because you cannot basically measure how many water molecules are passing the membrane directly. So that's a very important feature of ion channel, and that's why we have a a lot of information about ion channels as opposed to water channels or uh, transport of other species across the membrane. And the control of conduction in ion channels, usually we have three different mechanisms. These two are the main mechanisms which are uh, present in, in, in selective channels. Uh, potential, membrane potential or electrical uh, potential across the membrane is, the, is one of the usual mechanisms that can open and close channels, and this is present, for example, in some potassium channels. We can control the gating of a channel by a substrate, by a, a ligand. It could be a hormone, it could be a drug, or a neurotransmitter, and this is the case, for example, for nicotinic receptor, which is the sodium channel. Nicotine, when nicotine binds to this channel, basically it opens, and when you don't have nicotine present, it closes. So in this way, you can control the transport of sodium across the membrane by, by releasing a hormone in your blood. And we have a calcium channel, which is controlled by glutamate receptor, for example, or uh, other ligands. We have ion channels that can be re regulated by both mechanisms at the same time. And then we have actually mechanical gating, uh, and I think you heard about this yesterday, about the mechanosensitive channel that it could be sensitive to the the stretching of the membrane or the shape of the membrane, and that's, uh, of course, it cannot be very selective in a sense because it's not a very um, uh, precise mechanism to control the uh, an, a channel. Okay, so now a few examples of of these channels or membrane proteins which are available to us. I mean, for which we have PDB and the structure file. The problem with membrane proteins is that it's very difficult to crystallize them and get the crystal structure out of them. One problem is that you cannot get a, enough amount of the protein. It's very difficult to express these proteins in the species and produce a lot of uh, protein. Another pro problem is that they are happy inside the membrane, and when you try to crystallize them, basically you are taking them out of their natural environment, and that might influence their structure and stability. So there are two problems, and that's why we don't have many, many proteins, uh, membrane proteins with known crystal structure, as opposed to globular or water-soluble structures. So one example is the potassium channel. It is actually a tetramer, and uh, I mean the pore region. The pore region is the region through which ion is transported from one side to the other side. If you look at the pore region, you can see that it is formed of four monomers, and each monomer has an architecture like this. Two completely transmembrane regions, known as M1 and M2, and then we have something which we call the reentrant loop. It comes to the center of the uh, membrane and it returns and goes back. So four of these guys come together. Here, two of them are shown. We have actually one in front of us here, which is not shown, and one behind the plane. And actually, those, these non-helical parts, let me go back. 
you see that each loop is composed of a helical part, which is shown with this cylinder here, and then we have a non-helical loop here. These non-helical loops actually expose their carbonyl groups. So you can see that we have four arrays of these carbonyl groups coming together, and basically they provide a lot of stabilization energy if a positive charge approaches the, the interior of the channel. So you see, for example, if this is a potassium, which is outside and solvated by many water molecules, as it reaches this region, it, the, the solvation energy provided by water will be replaced by these carbonyl groups. And this stabilization continues until it passes the narrowest part of the channel, the selectivity filter of the channel. Uh, of course, I mean, the, the figure which is shown here, this is shown, uh, you, you see only the binding sites of potassium at different regions of the channel, but uh, it is now known that you cannot have two potassium channels at the same time in, in adjacent regions because they repel each other very strongly, and that's why people believe that the actual mechanism is that these sites are alternatively uh, filled with potassium, and uh, you cannot have two potassiums next to each other. So basically, one potassium approaches the channel from the other side. We have an open region which is filled with water here. You don't need to compensate for salvation energy because you have enough water molecules here. Potassium comes here, and then we have a series of trans hopping events here uh, that results in a release of a one, another potassium to the uh, other side of the membrane. So this is another view of the whole thing. You see that this is the region, this open region, which is filled with water, and this is the selectivity filter region. Potassium can come here. This filter decides whether or not this positive ion can pass the channel, and then after this uh, selectivity filter, basically you are fine because you, you, you approach again a lot of water molecules and you can simply diffuse to the other side of the membrane. So just remember this feature because we are going to come back to this later. You can see that those two non-helical parts of these two reentrant loops provide the selectivity filter, as we discussed. These are those parts that expose their carbonyl groups. But at the same time, you see that these helices, we have four of them here, also generate a negative field here, which can stabilize a positive charge at this point. So at the same time, you see that a very nice maneuver of the protein, by just having a small helical part and a non-helical part, you provide two very important functions to your, your system, generating an electric field here and providing a selectivity filter mechanism. So this is another example. This is gramicidin A. This is a completely different channel. It actually, uh, it's a dimer of a peptide. So if you put this peptide in, uh, in, in your medium, uh, it forms two helices, and these two helices find each other inside the membrane. And the pore form inside these two helices aligns, and then you, have, you can have actually a, a, a channel formed from the one side of the membrane to the other side. So in this way, basically, you insert a hole in, or leak inside the membrane. And that's why actually gramicidin can be used an, as an antibiotic because if you, if you have this guy in high concentration available, then it will be inserted inside the membrane and then it produces a, a leak through which ions and protons can be transported. So basically you are discharging the membrane and that could result in, uh, uh, in the death of the cell. So we have a lot of hydrophobic residues in the, in the outside because this is going to be inserted inside the membrane. And then inside the, inside the channel, we have actually polar groups, uh, and mainly carbonyl groups of the backbone that actually provide the stabilization energy for water and ions that want to pass the channel. So this is another view. This is actually a very nice example for, um, for molecular dynamic simulation because it's a very, very small channel. So you don't need a large patch of membrane and a lot of uh, atoms in your system to study gramicidin. And that's why it has been studied a lot by uh, 
simulation people and uh, many people study this because you can modify it and you can add groups to it. You can um, do a lot of manipulations to the system, which is one of the advantages of molecular dynamic simulations. You can do things that cannot be done in reality at all, but then by ch changing and manipulating the system, you can uh, test the hypothesis that you have about the function of the system and you can search for the source of the effects that you're observing in your simulation. This is a very, very important thing to remember. Always keep this in mind. How can I change the system and modify it and find out whether this is functional or not? That's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, yes, I mean, this is a top view, as you see. I mean, again, these hydrophobic groups, all side chains basically are exposed to the exterior of the channel and they interact uh, preferably with the hydrophobic region of the membrane and then inside you have a hydrophilic, hydrophilic channel which can be used by water and uh, charged species, mainly ions. We have other types of uh, membrane proteins which are used as, as channels but they are mainly called as pores because they are not selective in the in their function. Basically, they provide a big hole which can be used by many different substances to, to be transported across the membrane. Uh, these are called as porins, coming from pore, which means hole, and they usually have a better strand, uh, a better barrel structure. So you have a lot of polypeptide chains in better strand secondary structure, and they come together and they form hydrogen bonds with each other, and these hydrogen bonds close on each other, and then you can actually form a barrel inside the membrane. So we have usually oligomers of these guys inside the membrane, so you can have a lot of substances transported through, the, through these guys. But they are usually present in, in cells that, in which we have two different membranes because they provide a non-selective mechanism of transport across the membrane, they are here just to allow some molecules to reach the, the interior part or the, the periplasmic region. This is the region which is located between the two membranes. And from there, then we have selective mechanisms to allow some molecules to be transported to the cell and some should be blocked. So that's, uh, that's the case, for example, in mitochondria or some gram-negative bacteria. There, here are two examples, maltoporin and OMPF. And you can see that uh, this is the hydrophobic region of the channel, which is shown in white. You see the transmembrane part of the channel is mainly hydrophobic, as expected, because it is interacting with hydrophobic core of the membrane. And then in the water-exposed regions, we have a lot of charge and polar groups which are shown in color. Same on the other side. Then we have actually proteins which are not simple channels. They, they in fact function as pumps. For example, bacteriodopsin is a protein that uh, after absorption of light, basically it does a, some uh, isomerization and some chemical reaction and then it basically effectively pumps a proton from the cytoplasmic side to the extracellular side of the membrane, and that results in a, in a proton gradient across the membrane. Uh, this is not really a channel, it's, it's more a pump. So this proton gradient is used by other proteins. I mean, in this case, we are talking about ATP synthase in this particular example, which is composed of a membrane part and a soluble part. The membrane part actually can sense the proton gradient, can allow proton to, to be transported from one side to the other side, but it couples this motion of proton to the rotation of this ring shown here schematically. So basically you are coupling the transmembrane uh, motion of, uh, of a proton to a mechanical uh, energy and this mechanical energy will be used by the other part to produce ATP. So proton gradient is very important for many cells and you can kill the cell if you dissipate this proton gradient. So that's a very important uh, feature and for the energetics of, of many cells. Okay, so that was supposed to be my brief introduction. Okay. <laughs> 